Ian, I've read many of your books and I've watched so much of your content. I mean, I've absorbed all the information I possibly can. And I still right. have to ask you this question, just so that I can clarify my perception of your view of unconsciousness. To you, what is consciousness, yes. Ian? I think it would be rather like asking a fish to describe what water is, because it's the one element that we know from the inside. It's, it's what we live in. Um, it, it's remarkable that there are um, people holding down positions at universities who deny that there is such a thing as consciousness, because it's the one thing that we can't doubt. The only thing we can't doubt is consciousness. Um, but yeah, um, of course, it's used in different ways in different contexts. So uh, one meaning of consciousness is what you don't have when you're in a coma. But another meaning of consciousness is the stuff that's immediately accessible to you in the waking state. And the rest of everything that you know is described as unconscious. But it doesn't mean that you are unconscious in the sense that you would be knocked out and on a bed in a hospital. So th there's those different meanings. But I guess you're asking really about the, the meaning of consciousness, uh, not in the sense of um, not being comatose, but in the sense of uh, having an awareness of the world, which is the, the best way one can put it. When, when you think about philosophical views, I mean, the mind body problem, this, this podcast is called mind body solution, obviously predicated on right. the infamous mind body problem from your side. Yeah. You had to give me a philosophical history of the mind body problem and each philosopher that inspired you, influenced you and got you to where you are today in terms of how you think about this problem. What story would you tell me? <laughs> Well, I would tell you probably about my early days following uh, graduation in Oxford in with a degree in English literature. And I was unhappy with the way in the academic world literature was approached. There were a number of things that were wrong with it, I felt. One is that whatever a great work of art is, whether that be a poem or a painting or, or a piece of music, it can't be turned into explicit language without losing just about everything that's important about it. And a number of the things that disappear are first all that is implicit. And I became convinced that although people could uh, argue with me that why should it be better to be implicit than to be explicit, that virtually everything that matters to us is only um, is, is something we can deal with only in an implicit form. If we try to deal with it explicitly, we destroy it, rather like telling a joke and then having to explain it. Another thing about the work of art is that if it is a successful work of art, it's completely unique. Um, whereas the process of criticism turned it into this body of thought here, this sentiment there, and so forth, which didn't seem to me to help. And I suppose the third thing was that it was embodied that reading a poem, watching a painting or a film or anything that is alive with um, meaning is an embodied experience. Music is a deeply embodied experience, obviously, but so is poetry. And when you read poetry, you find that your whole body is responding it to it. Your, your blood pressure, your pulse, uh, the hair on your skin may move, the, the tears may come to your eyes, all kinds of things happen, your blood pressure changes. So um, I thought, gosh, what's wrong with this is we've got to understand better what the relationship between mind and body is. And I had won a fellowship which allowed me seven years with no obligations to do anything, not to teach, uh, not to give a report on what I was doing, uh, not to publish, but just to think. It's an extraordinary thing. It, it, I don't know whether it still is like that, but it is the, the, the extraordinary gift of a particular college at oh, Oxford please. All Souls College. <laughs> Sorry? I said it sounds amazing. <laughs> Yes, yes. And, and it, there, there are no students at this college, it's only fellows. So it's like a kind of, 
a uh, very extraordinary environment for people who need to think together and or think separately. Uh, and during this period, I went to a lot of philosophy seminars. One of my colleagues there was uh, Derek Parfit, which you, you may know the name of. He was a very distinguished philosopher. Um, and I listened to him and others in these seminars. And I felt that the point was somehow being missed because it was being discussed in an entirely disembodied way, uh, you know, in a seminar room, sometimes underground somewhere in Oxford. And I was thinking, no, this is not the way to understand this problem. To understand this problem, one needs to see it in practice, in experience in the world. And what that meant to me was to train as a doctor and to specialize in the area of overlap between neurology and psychiatry. Uh, at that moment, Oliver Sacks had just produced his great book, Awakenings, and uh, I thought it was, well, it was for me life-changing, because I saw that actually what he did was to show how the mind and the body relate in these patients, how when they thought in a certain way, it changed their, their physical symptoms. When they had physical problems, it changed their mentality, changed the way their brain worked. And also he managed to do something else, which is very special, which is to take individual cases of patients and see the general in the particular. So that although these people were quite rounded out as um, pictures of individual people, he could make general points through that. And that seemed to me very profound. I found that Goethe is a great uh, exponent of this, that you can see the general in the individual, the unique and the particular. So with all this in mind, I went off and I became a, a lowly medical student at the age of 28, which in England is unusual. You'd normally begin, begin medical school at 18. Um, but I think it wasn't a disadvantage because I approached medicine with, um, you know, an interest in philosophy. And that meant that when I was learning all this stuff that a lot of my younger colleagues just thought of as so much data, so many bits of information, it was building a picture for me. And out of that and out of my experience in the borderlines between neuro neurology and psychiatry, and a little of research and a lot of reading of other people's research, I finally came to an understanding of what I think and, and believe about that so-called problem, the mind-body problem. I say so-called, by the way, because I don't think it's a problem. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I think it's only a problem if, if you think in an entirely abstract way, yes. but rather like consciousness only being a problem. If you step out of it and think, what the hell is that? Get back in it, you know, and get back into the mind body reality, which we all live in. So, so when you think about, um, let's say, David Chalmers, I mean, when he gave the infamous lecture where he, he described this as the hard problem of consciousness, or yes. what do you think about that? What, what comes to mind when someone mentions it's a hard problem? Well, ori well originally I was um, I was very interested and impressed by this this uh, frank announcement that this was a hard problem because I believe it is, but it's only as big a problem as you set it up to be. So if you if you reason that a human being is um, something material perhaps mechanical almost but that contains this self-awareness then how do these things connect it's very very difficult but if you see the body as not just mere lumpen matter in the sense of mere material uh, in fact i don't think there's any such thing as mere material but certainly you can't see the body as such then there isn't so big a problem because you come to a position, the position that I hold to cut to the chase, that matter is itself uh, imbued with consciousness and there is no great divide between matter and consciousness. They are perhaps different aspects, different phenomenal uh, revelations of something that is one and the same. 
So uh, the the image that I give is is um, people say, well, matter doesn't seem like consciousness, and consciousness doesn't seem like matter at all. They have quite different properties. But I say yes, but water is completely different from ice. Water is flowing. It's transparent. It moves over your body. Ice is immensely hard. It could break your head. It's opaque, and it doesn't move unless it's given a push. So these are quite different things. And indeed, water can also be. Um, invisible it can be in the air around you without you being able to see it all these are water but they have utterly different qualities mm. to me when when i read your books i mean um the matter with things uh Moss and his emissary and i think in 2012 you also published another one um but more more around the unhappiness um of of why we're unhappy um i remember just thinking it reminded me a lot of the work done by Michael Gazaniga. Um, I'm sure that comes yeah. comes comes to you often. And just by the way, I mean, you mentioned Oliver Sacks. When I started this podcast, he was one of those people who got me into this field. Um, for me, it was the right. man who took his wife for a hat. The, the way he yes. was able yes. to bring in, um, I mean, I think of Sacks as more of a psychiatrist than a neurologist. He was a doctor of the soul. He genuinely looked at the yes. phenomenological yes. experiences yes. of these people, and he treated them like people, um, which I found very yes. beautiful. Yes. And I think that's where you work, yes. the interface of the mind and body. As a psychiatrist, as a philosopher, you are at that very interface. And the work you've done is, is, is quite exceptional. Just I'm a, I'm a fan of it, and um, yeah. I, I want to touch on it. So I think let's start off with when you look at a human being, we are clearly not just one person. There, there seems to be sort of a divide. Let's discuss that divide and what it's all about. Are you referring here to the different ways in which the two hemispheres work? Because that, I imagine, is what you're talking about. Yes. Well, the first thing I'd have to say to anyone coming new to this area who hasn't read my work is put out of your mind everything you think you know about hemisphere differences because it's all wrong. <laughs> there are one or two details in the picture that are probably okay, but 97% of it is, is completely wrong. So when I started thinking about these differences, people said, don't, don't go there, don't, don't research this because your career will be ruined. I mean, nobody will take you seriously because it's all thought to be pop psychology. But it seemed to me there were some important ideas and some important indicators there that suggested that there was something profound going on. And what really influenced me was um, the work of John Cutting, who was a contemporary, well, no, not a contemporary, he's a, a considerably older contemporary of mine, um, at the Maudsley Hospital in London. And he gave a lecture one day in 1990 on a book that was just being published by Oxford University Press called The Right Cerebral Hemisphere and Psychiatric Disorders. And that struck me as very interesting because in medical school, I'd heard an awful lot about the left hemisphere, but not very much about the right. And in that lecture, he said many things that just completely blew my mind because he was he'd spent a lot of time doing what psychiatrists and neurologists don't generally do, which is spending time at the bedside of patients who have something that's happened to their brain and their world changes. And it was this that he he let me see that when people have had damage to the right hemisphere, their world changes in a much more radical way than when there is damage to the left hemisphere. When there's damage to the left hemisphere, often patients, for the most part, they will have, um, many of them certainly will have difficulties with speech, possibly with understanding language, and they will have difficulty perhaps using their right hand. So this seems very important. But in fact, in terms of philosophical interest and what actually happens to that human individual, it's far less drastic than what happens after a right hemisphere stroke. The left hemisphere person, they may be frustrated by not being able to use their hand in the way they're used to, not being able to speak in the way they're used to. They can be trained to those things, but their personality, their way of understanding the world is intact. But when something damages the right hemisphere, if it damages it badly enough, the whole of reality is changed. And one of the things that he said, 
struck me as very relevant coming from this background in which I'd written a book called Against Criticism about what was wrong with the way in which we analysed works of art. Um, he said that the right hemisphere was much better at understanding implicit meaning, such as it is in metaphor and in poetry, as well as sense of humour, uh, puns, jokes, sarcasm, irony, all the ways in which we express ourselves more flexibly with implicit meaning, not just explicit meaning in the way that a computer would understand it. And then he said, the right hemisphere is more connected with the body in various ways. It's in the right hemisphere that there is the so-called body image which, as you know, is not a, an image just in a visual sense, but a, an image of the body in all modalities. And it has closer connections between the frontal cortex and the cingulate cortex and parts of the limbic system, which means um, for the layman that there is a closer relationship between thinking and feeling in the right hemisphere than there is in the left. And it also has a powerful effect, the right hemisphere, on the autonomic nervous system, uh, probably more important one than the left hemisphere. So in all these ways, it's, it's dealing with the embodied. And then, he said, and the right hemisphere understands a unique person, a unique case, whereas the left hemisphere tends to almost immediately want to categorize. So it takes the general out of the unique and puts it in a category, whereas the right hemisphere remains with the uniqueness. So, of course, these were the three things that I had <laughs> isolated as being the problem with the disembodied way in which we practiced the business of approaching works of art and indeed life and that these things were to do with the right hemisphere and after that there was no going back I mean after I heard that I knew that my life was going to be looking into this fascinating question that everyone had just dismissed and the reason they dismissed it, as you know, is that people used to say very simplistic things like that um, the left hemisphere is unemotional, and the right hemisphere is emotional, that the left hemisphere is rational, the right hemisphere is irrational, and that only the left hemisphere understands language and the right hemisphere doesn't, and things like this. But as you know, because um, you've read my books, in fact, both hemispheres are involved in everything. They're involved in reason. They're involved in emotion. They're involved in language, just in a reliably different way. And it was what that difference was that I wanted to investigate. So I set about um, setting aside time for myself to, to research it. I went to the Institute of Psychiatry. It's the big um, research centre for psychiatry in Britain, uh, joined to the Maudsley Hospital. And... Uh, really people wanted me to do very, uh, uh, they wanted me to join somebody else's research team and do things like clone the P450 receptor, which is no doubt a very fine thing to do, but it wasn't actually a, a, an effort to address the problem that philosophically drove me. And so I decided I'd have to do it myself, really. So between my patients and reading and a bit of research, which I did at Johns Hopkins on asymmetry in the brain and in schizophrenia, I began to put together a picture that made sense. I mean, it makes so much sense as well. But f for, for those people who haven't read it, um, you I'm doing there's even some really cool videos online. I think I watched one of your animations a while back, where, where you're explaining yeah, yeah. this. And I think it's where you're giving a lecture during that time. And someone has just made it an animation, because you hear the crowd laughing. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it was uh, less than a year after the publication of The Master and His Emissary, so in 2010, I gave a lecture to the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts in London. Um, and there is an animation, you're quite right. The lecture lasted about half an hour, and then there were Q&A. But what the animator did was take 10 minutes out of those 30 minutes and illustrate it with, I think, a very witty cartoon. And, you know, to begin with, um, Jonathan Rousen, who was the head of the Social Brain Project at RSA, said, you know, we'd really like to do an, an, an animation. And I thought, oh, no, um, the last thing I want is to be labelled as this man who still believes in hemisphere differences. And there's a cartoon out of it as well. And that would just sort of dumb the whole thing down. But he persuaded me that the man who was their animator I really understood the book, had read it and really understood it. And so I said, yeah, go ahead. And it it's been wonderful. It's gathered so many views. I mean, it's it's so informative. It gives you such great insight into where you're coming from, what your views are, 
but it does do it doesn't do any justice to your actual writing i mean you if you read the book there's so many times well while reading it where you're blown away by something that you say perhaps a sentence or two and 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 often it's like or just a general statement that you're making that's very mind-blowing to to someone who studied i mean when i studied medicine when we learned about the brain there were so many misconceptions um that i look back and think about right now that i've learned and studied as gospel this was the truth and then to 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 find out from another researcher like yourself uh, that it's not the same way that we even learned it in med school i mean it, it's it's quite frightening yeah. actually yeah. psychiatrists yeah. Uh, I mean, and even some of the average psychiatrists i think about don't know about a lot of the work that you've done and a lot of the things that we figured out today um, in terms of the differences no, no. let's let's talk about how the, the I mean the left hemisphere is is looking at things very very specifically it's honing in and it's and it's really looking at detail whereas the right is is looking at a broader perspective i mean you use one of those infamous uh, sayings with the net Let, let's discuss these different differences in more detail yes okay perhaps it's worth saying that every every brain every neural network even back to the most primitive organisms that we know uh, a creature, a sea creature called Nemesis cellovectensis, which is 700 million years old. Already, the neural network, which has been described as the origin of what would later become our brain, is asymmetrical. Why? Why should the brain be asymmetrical? But it is. Our brain is not the same in the left hemisphere and right hemisphere. If you look at it, if you measure it, if you weigh it, if you photograph it, never mind if you start to work out the ways in which it's functioning. So its structure is different and its functioning is different. And there's a big divide, you know, between these two hemispheres with just a, a sort of band at the base that connects them. Only 2% of all neurons actually cross from the right hemisphere to the left or from the left hemisphere to the right. Why set up a system where you're keeping things apart? This was the, the question that really uh, got me going. Um, and I, I reckon that, in fact, every creature has to solve a problem if it's going to survive. And that is how to get stuff, get food, pick up a twig to build a nest, whatever it is, grab hold of something that is of use and yet keep out at the same time the broadest possible attention for a predator or for, in fact, for your mate who, who you should be sharing the food that you're trying to get with or whatever it is. But one hemisphere, and it is the left hemisphere, certainly in humans and in most of the animals that we've looked at, is the one that is, as it were, in the service of the predator in us, the one that enables us to grab things, um, you know, for listeners who I don't know whether I imagine all your listeners are if they're part of this series they will know a lot about this but it's the left hemisphere that controls the right hand with which for most of us we do the grabbing um so it's that's the the the, the idea about the left hemisphere is that it is very narrowly focused and it attends to something that you've already prioritized as important i need to get hold of that seed ahead of that bird i need to catch that rabbit or whatever it is but if that's the only kind of uh, attention it'll pay it, it, it will become somebody else's lunch while it's getting its own so there is another kind of attention which is quite the opposite of this it's broad it's open it's vigilant it's sustained over time and it gives the bigger picture and you can't do both these things with the same neural neuronal mass you can't dispose that consciousness towards the world in two different ways so the solution that nature has come up with is two masses each of which can sustain consciousness separately and each can take a different view of it and that leads of course to a different world because if you attend to the world in one way you see some things there if you attend in a different way you see a different world how can you summarize this where well, you can say this very narrowly targeted attention to detail highly focused is extremely good at isolating things but it in doing so it it takes away all the context everything that is surrounding it that it belongs to so it sees elements of experience as atomistic fragments that to make any sense you'd have to put them together and build something in the way that we do make a machine 
um, it sees them as fixed because this stair that enables you to grab something is essentially trying to isolate it from space and time so that you can get hold of it. It wants it to be like a snapshot so that you can get hold of it. Whereas the right hemisphere is seeing that these things are not isolated from their context. They're multiply interconnected with almost everything around them, that they are constantly moving and changing and indeed flowing. So this is a quite different picture of the world. And it goes on that the right hemisphere understands the implicit, the left sees only the explicit, largely. All these things are gross generalizations, but we can't go into the detail, but that's largely true. Um, and they become disembodied when the left hemisphere takes them up because it's taking them out of context. Overall, what one sees is that the left hemisphere is basically doing a representation of the world. And the right hemisphere is trying to be there, a presence, allowing the presence of the world to come into being for us. So there's a distinction to be made between the presence of something in which you haven't already turned it into a concept, but you're trying to be there with it in the way that mindfulness meditation trains you to stop the monkey mind, which is the left hemisphere talking about it, but actually just be there and experience it. That's the right hemisphere. But the left hemisphere is always representing, which literally means making it present again, when actually it's no longer present. So this is a kind of false vision, a two dimensional schematic vision of the world, which is very useful. It's useful because it acts like a map. In a map, all the detail about the world is left out. All you see is just a, a, an outline. And that map is not the reality, but it wouldn't be more useful if it contained more information. So the right hemisphere sees a picture that is very complicated, contains a lot of information. The left hemisphere has boiled this down, if you like, to a skeleton, to a schema, to a theory. So in a way, the contrast that I'd like to make is between the left hemisphere working in theory with maps and diagrams and the right hemisphere actually reporting on everyday reality as we experience it. And not just everyday reality, but every aspect of reality. When, when you were doing this work, I mean, I know because Gazaniga has also done a lot of split brain work. I mean, you cut the corpus callosum. Uh, you he figured out quite a lot. I remember he was also one of those people when I read some of the, the papers, I realized like this is quite fascinating stuff. Um, but his work, I remember in Frankish's illusionism as a theory of consciousness. I mean, he got together a bunch of papers, Daniel Dennett, Susan Blackmore, and Nicholas Humphrey, Zaniga. They use the same sort of split brain uh, information as a way to prove that consciousness does not exist. So um, it's more of, I mean, there's clearly an illusion of unity here. There's clearly two brains. There's two people inside one head. Um, how, why do you think they do this? Why do you think they use the same information and draw such a completely different conclusion? Well, um, I think it depends what you think a brain is. If you think of it as a machine, then you have to explain how can this machine have consciousness? And it starts from consciousness being a problem. And if you are wedded to the idea that this is a machine, then all it can do is represent the world in a way that a camera or a video or a film or whatever it is represents the world. It gives the idea that inside our cranium, we're sort of locked into something where we're seeing um, a mock-up or a representation of reality, but we don't actually have contact with reality. Whereas if instead you don't problematize consciousness, but more problematize matter, then you see that consciousness is a primary element of experience. We can't have experience without consciousness, and we can't know anything without it coming via our consciousness. I, I mean, I, I say this, look, I know and experience consciousness. And in that consciousness, I find matter, I only know matter, because I have consciousness, but I don't know that I only have consciousness because I have matter. That's possible. It may come from the brain or not, but I do not know 
that consciousness depends on matter, but I do know that everything I know about matter depends on my consciousness. So in a way to deny consciousness is, is absurd, really. I mean, it's, um, it's described by Galen Strawson, uh, an Anglo-American analytic philosopher in Britain, as um, the deepest woo-woo of the human mind, to suppose that there is no consciousness. Um, so I think I know all the people that you mention, and I know that they form a certain subset of thinkers who espouse this very hard uh, materialistic view, but it's not one that I myself can embrace because it doesn't tally with experience, it doesn't tally with my philosophical uh, thinking and researching, it doesn't tally with my experience as a doctor, it doesn't uh, tally with my experience as a mere human being. Mm. So, so which group of people would you say do align with your views? I mean, you've got you've got other groups like your panpsychists, Philip Goff on the other side. You've got people like Donald Hoffman mm. doing some amazing work with physics, um, trying to prove mm. that consciousness is fundamental. You've got Bernardo Castro. I mean, yes. idealism. Um, there are so many people with with different views. Where would you say you fall on the spectrum? Do you have a specific ism to your consciousness view? Well, as a, a fair question, um, the names that you more recently spoke of um, Philip Goff and uh, Bernardo Kastrup and to some part, certainly Donald Hoffman, um, I do I do very much resonate with what they have to say. But I can't say that my position is exactly like um, an idealist of any kind or um, a realist of any particular kind because the the missing bit for me and this is a very odd thing to say i understand is that i believe relationships are foundational so i actually believe that relations are prior to the things that are related. Ontologically, they are more fundamental and prior to the things that emerge from the relationship. Now that sounds very peculiar to most people because they assume, well, they're just things. And then once there are things, they have relations. But uh, I'm glad to say that I'm not alone in this and that um, David Merman, and he's not the only philosopher, states precisely this, that relations are prior to, ontologically, to the things that are related. And in helping people understand that, I talk about Indra's net, which is an image from the Vedanta, in which um, there is a net that covers the cosmos. And in this net, there are suspended from every in, uh, point where there is a crossing of the fibers, um, a little a jewel which reflects every other jewel in the net. So there is a kind of holistic, um, not holistic, sorry, um, a holarchical um, view of uh, nested, uh, that the reality is, is nested in that way, almost fractal in that way. But the point that's of interest here is that a net begins from threads that are to connect, but they only connect once they're put together. Those are the relations. And then the things, the little crossing points attract our attention. We go, oh, look, there's something interesting. And it's got a little jewel on it. There's a thing, but the thing is only a marker to a web of relationships. The web is primary. Why that is important is it means that the idea that either there is a reality somehow separate from us, or that it, the reality is made up by our minds. Each of these misses um, the important point that what we take for reality emerges out of a coming together, an encounter of whatever my consciousness is with the rest of reality, which I refer to as whatever it is, because we don't know what it is. But there is a connection between them, and I, I believe it's a, re, um, a resonant or reverberative connection, so that what there is out there affects our consciousness, but our consciousness affects what it is we find out there, and may indeed, though that is speculative, I admit, may actually change what there is, because if consciousness is capable of changing the state of matter, depending on its uh, the nature of that consciousness, then obviously consciousness and matter can't be thought of as entirely separate. Mm -hmm. So in that case, how we attend to the world, what we find there 
is a deeply moral business. We help create what is. And what there is then affects us in turn. So this constant reverberation. In fact, in the way I described it, it sounds like a, a sequential process where, as it were, A affects B and B affects A and A then affects B and so on. But it's not quite like that. It's something that is not easy for the Western mind to comprehend, but it's the, the reality of of total interdependence in which things come into being together they co-arise and they 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 grow together um in in, a, in an image of kind of intersecting spirals if you like or there are many ways you can think of it but that they they both aid one another's coming into being so that's the way i i view it i i view that that there isn't just a reality a thing out there and there isn't just something in my head but these two connect and obviously it follows from that that it's not good enough to imagine that what we know stops at the walls of some room into which we are placed inside our heads we are not in that position of detachment or complete division from the world we are distinct from the world around us but only superficially so we are in connection with it i'm, I'm just trying to think about how how this sort of links to other theories i mean uh, have you heard of four e cognition Sorry? Have you heard of 4E cognition? 4Es like... 4E cognition. Yeah. So basically they talk no, about... No, I haven't. We're, we're embodied beings... No, no. Um, ...embedded in an environment um, that we have to yes, get enact upon. And we obviously have now extended our cognition uh, via the technological yes. tools that we use. Uh, that's something rolling okay. around at the moment. Uh, I know a lot of people are working on that. I mean, how does this link to that sort of thinking, that inactivist, embodied, or even maybe intentionality um th does this have any sort of link to the to those types of theories yes it absolutely does in a number of ways first of all to deal with Im the embodied and the embedded perhaps together that um cognition is not an abstract process but is something that's carried out with a whole of the person and the information is not sort of information in an abstract way that could be printed as a readout. It is something that is experienced in the whole of the body of the person who is thinking. And that it is also embedded in an environment uh, which is all the other things around us which go to affect us as all creatures affect their environment and are affected by their environment. I, I'm very interested in the work, I'll just mention this very briefly, of um, an American um, biologist called Kriti Sharma. He wrote, she wrote a book called Interdependence, which deals with this uh, issue in, I think, a very beautiful and, and deep way. Um, so I, those are the sort of thoughts I have about that. But this notion also takes in the idea that we are not sort of isolated from the world, but are in some ways... Um, uh, we find out what we are and we find out what is and we find out what our thoughts are in action. Uh, thought and feeling are inseparably connected with the idea of action and lead to action. So they, they prompt us towards certain kinds of action and certain kinds of action change the way in which we think and feel. So these things are all bound up with one another. I, one of the many things that I invert in the book, The Matter With Things, you know, in the very first few pages, I say that we, we think of things in one way, but I think of them in another. Well, one of those examples is motion. So that in the Newtonian universe, the, um, the, the sort of, uh, the, the, the um, original state, if you like, um, the untouched state is one of um, immobility and it, something has to come along to set it in motion. But from what we know in physics now, we know that nothing is ever fully static. There isn't anything in the cosmos that is entirely static. And in fact, if it could be achieved, which, as I say, it can't entirely be achieved, it would be um, the state of stasis that would have to be explained, not the existence of motion. And that's one of many cases in which I, I reverse the way in which we've been 
um, encouraged to think since the environment and the scientific revolution of the 17th century um, that what we take for primary may be secondary and what we take for secondary may be primary. I remember while, while reading your book, I mean, I think even once I think you mentioned it, um, I mean, you mentioned Louis Saez, um and Parnes. I mean, I mean, when I was doing my 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 dissertation, I remember I used Saz and Parnes's um, schizophrenia tools, which are the E's and the E A W E, mm. the uh, examination of anomalous self experience yes. and examination of anomalous That's world right. experience. I mean, these are phenomenological right. psychopathologists in action. Um, taking yes. an entire yes. lived world experience. It's no longer just separate yes. entities. This is a mutually symbiotic relationship that we have. And I get a lot of that from yep. you. Do you feel that, that it's, that it's a worthy? Yes, I do. And I, I, I need to acknowledge that um, the other, or, or at least one of the other um, mind-changing, life-changing uh, books for me was Sasser's Madness and Modernism, which I read uh, back in 1992 when it came out and carried on reading and rereading for two or three years. And I, I reviewed it for the London Review of Books because I thought it was so important and so profound that somebody should write about it. Um, and I, I think that their insight, particularly Sass's insight into the nature of schizophrenia, is utterly riveting. What he illuminates is that in schizophrenia there are certain um, modes of being which, uh, which seem abnormal and indeed lead to uh, radically abnormal ways of conceiving the world. Um, and yet have their own sort of coherence and that they are also to be found in modernism. And this was very striking for me. He showed that the phenomena that I knew very well because I treated so many patients with schizophrenia, um, the, the aspects of their world were also uh, shown in, in the movements of modernism and postmodernism in the, since the beginning of the 20th century. This seemed to be absolutely extraordinary. And what Sass um, doesn't suggest is that we've all suddenly got schizophrenia, but he leaves it open in, in an appendix. He suggests that it could have something to do with lateralization in the brain. And at that time, I was actually imaging and, and putting together information about uh, the brains of schizophrenics to do with their asymmetry, the lateralization of them. And we don't need to go into this in any detail, but effectively um, in schizophrenia, it's common to find that the brain has the reversed asymmetry. There is a normal asymmetry to the human brain that it is reversed or absent. And a lot of the things that seem to work rather oddly or abnormally in a subject with schizophrenia are dependent on areas which are the ones that where the asymmetry is most important, so-called um, heteromodal association cortex, which is the top level at which we construct the world. So this was, you know, dynamite to me. And I began thinking, yes, yes, when you look at the world as described in modernism, it is so like the world that a person who has right hemisphere damage has. And in the new book, The Matter With Things, which came out in, in November uh, 2021, uh, as you know, I have a whole quite long chapter on what schizophrenia and autism can tell us. And um, I don't want to be simplistic or reductionist about this because it is uh, more complex than I'm going to make it sound now. But in many ways, some types of autism certainly, and many aspects of schizophrenia are remarkably like the experiences of people who have um, damage to the right hemisphere, either an injury or a stroke or a tumor or something like that. And what seems to happen is that the world loses its soul, if you like. Um, it becomes inanimate, it becomes uh, fragmented, it becomes very difficult to interpret because you can't understand all that implicit meaning. Why is that person smiling? What do they mean when they say that? That's the opposite of what seems to be the case. Doesn't understand that irony or sarcasm is being used. Um, so when the patient is in this position, they only see certain aspects of the world. They only understand 
um, the sort of explicit things that you could train, um, you know, a robot at a very, very high level to understand. You could give it a lexicon, you could give it a grammar of the English language, um, but it still wouldn't really be able to understand human experience or what's going on or why is that person saying that or doing that. That ability to get inside someone else, which we know is one of the problems for people with autism and for schizophrenia, to see what it feels like to be that person. Um, which we call um, by the name of something that really uh, isn't. Um, but let's just leave that aside. The point is, it's it's something that is deeply embodied in people and very important for their sense of what is human. Mm. That, that theory of mind, so trying to put yourself into their shoes. <laughs> exactly. But I, I, I thought better of saying theory of mind because people might pick up that somehow it's a theory and it's just about mind, but it isn't. <laughs> it's about the whole embodied person and it's not just a theory. It's something that when, when an animal has theory of mind and, you know, in the old days, um, when I was training, of course, the only creatures that had theory of mind were humans. And indeed, they didn't have it until they were at least four. Um, and it never developed in some people with, uh, with, with autism, and it was often a problem in schizophrenia. But we now know that so many animals have this, that certainly the great apes have theory of mind, but magpies have theory of mind, seals have theory of mind, camels have theory of mind. Just about everywhere you look, they have theory of mind. And you know, how do we know that? Well, for example, a, a squirrel may um, be wanting to bury a store of food, but it's very important that only it knows where it's buried the, 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 the food, the nuts. And so it will look around and see that it's being observed and it will pretend to bury. And then it will wait until whoever it is has gone away and then bury things somewhere else. Now that shows that that squirrel is able to see that what the other squirrel knows is not the same as what I know. And that is the, that is the basis of theory of mind. And it's quite a sophisticated um, thing to have developed. You know, we see, we see our, our, our pets, if you have a dog at home, if you have a cat, you see them do this all the time. They're trying to hide their treat, uh, they're just trying to make sure no one else is around. I mean, this is very common. For you, where do you draw the line when it comes to different species and different animals um, in terms of having consciousness or having this phenomenal experience that we have as humans? Well, to put it briefly, I don't draw a line. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a line there uh, between some animals and some others. There's only a continuum. It's all gradual. There isn't a hard and fast categorical difference at any point. And I think the evidence suggests to me that consciousness goes a very long way down, as we say, considering ourselves a long way up in the tree of life. Um, in fact, uh, you probably know uh, that in chapter, I think it's 25, where I deal with matter and consciousness, which is quite a long chapter, it's the length of a short book in itself, I suggest that we need to see that consciousness can be present, not just because of something that has evolved. It can't have evolved out of matter that was wholly unconscious. People say it emerged, but it, to me, this is sleight of hand. What it is really doing is saying there's something goes on between these two completely separate compartments, matter that has no consciousness and somehow matter that does. And I'm just going to put a black box over it and go, it emerged. But as far as I'm concerned, that's like saying, and a miracle happens here. Uh, so I, I'm not convinced by this. And in fact, you 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 mentioned the names of um, people who are panpsychists. And I am a panpsychist, at least in the sense that I believe that spirit, soul, matter, con matter and consciousness are not somehow derivable from something else, that the consciousness that we experience is not a derivable out of something utterly different that has no consciousness. You can't posit that. You can only posit that consciousness actually evolves in the sense that it's always been there in the cosmos and it takes certain forms as life evolves. And I'm not on my own in saying that because in the Oxford Companion to the Mind, um, 
edited by um, V. S. Ramachandran and Colin Blakemore, who are two distinguished neuroscientists, very much mainstream, they say on this matter that we may have in the end to accept that consciousness is something that is an ontological primitive. It is it is something that is part of the building blocks of the cosmos, and you can't get behind it and find what it comes out of, because it's from it that other things come. I, I like that view. Of course, that's in... Sorry, sorry, continue. No, I was just going to say, and of course, as we get there and as we get into many of the things that I found followed from neuroscience and philosophy and physics for that matter, we come towards a world which looks much more like that described by the great wisdom traditions, uh, particularly the East, but also the West. I mean, I love that you do that as well in your book. I mean, you look at it from the, the best neuroscience, best philosophy, the best physics and you try and combine these three fields because these are the fundamental i mean fields that are looking into these topics these are the ones searching yes. in line with that i mean we've got some physical theories like i mean i mentioned hoffman before but we've also got some other physics materialistic theories that are similar to panpsychism but not really if you look at i i i t um integrated information theory i mean it's taking consciousness as being fundamental and then working its way up what are your thoughts on that well, the kind of consciousness that I am talking about at the level of a piece of metal or a piece of stone is something completely different from the kind of consciousness we we think of when we talk about our own consciousness. And you may well say, well, in that case, why call it consciousness at all? Partly because awareness seems to be important at the level of the most basic building blocks in physics. One of the most extraordinary findings of modern physics is that we cannot separate consciousness from matter. We have to take it into account. I know there are uh, some physicists who would deny that uh, because all these areas are extremely difficult to understand. And of course, there are many different theories, but there are enough very high level physicists who take that position. And I would say it was probably the normal position um, in, in lost you there, but Ian, let's just check if the connection's fine. I'm going to send you a message, Ian. I think I've lost you a bit. Oh, can I, you see me now? We're back we, again. Did we have yes. a technical difficulty there? <laughs> I, d I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, sorry. I wonder can, where I should go back, go back to, you know? Um, what are you, well, sorry, I was trying to figure out what was going on. I sent Mary a message saying, is Ian still alive? <laughs> oh. Just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have no idea, idea what happened there, except except that I've been uh, on one Zoom or another pretty much all day, and maybe the machines have got tired of it. <laughs> no, um, mm. I think you were talking about consciousness and AI. Oh, yeah, no, so, no, no, so, so what I wanted to talk about actually was IIT and consciousness, um, and, and how that theory sort of, okay. is it similar? What's the link to panpsychism and perhaps to, to how it relates to your view? Sorry, so you're using IT to mean what? Then? Oh, sorry, I like inter integrated information theory. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Christoph Koch. Oh. And Christoph Koch's work. Oh, I am, yes, yes, it's, okay. Because what IIT yes. does is well, consciousness to be fundamental and they use pi I mean, sorry, phi, um, and as the amount of consciousness for each thing, and they give each thing a level of phi as conscious as they give consciousness its fundamental nature and reality. Um, you're not doing that, and I get that you're not doing that, but 
I'm just trying to figure out what are your thoughts on that theory in general? Well, I, I, to, to be honest, I don't know it in enough detail, really. To I have read Koch, um, but it, it didn't appeal to me at the time, and I haven't really thought about it very much since. Um, I thought there was a, essentially a problem of um, attempting to explain how something comes about due merely to complexity. Uh, am I right that that's part of the... The yeah. theory that I think he's trying to take yes. a reductionist, but he calls it romantic reductionism. So it's a <laughs> it's still still a very good search, soul searching, uh, search for consciousness using reductionism, uh, biological reduction. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I'm not sure quite what the advantage is in using that because biological reductionism is a very particular way of thinking, which is in fact. Um, for me, uh, the exact expression of how the left hemisphere would try to understand life. It would uh, try and break it down into its basic parts and see how they relate and reconstruct it like a machine. But there's nothing mechanical about an organism. Um, as you know, in chapter 12 of the new book, I, I talk about the, the biology, uh, the, the science of life, as a kind of a takeover by the left hemisphere, capture by the left hemisphere. Uh, and that at the same time that physicists are seeing things in terms that the left hemisphere doesn't really like or understand, that there are paradoxes and that we can't just think using everyday language about these things. The left hemisphere is soldiering on with this belief that as long as it keeps taking the thing down a level, it will understand what it's dealing with. But that seems to suggest that complexity on its own can produce something. And I'm not sure that it can. I'm not convinced that complexity is enough. I mean, to give a very simple point, and one that, um, you know, I'm sure that there are answers to, but the complexity of the human um, neocortex is, is enormous. But the complexity of the cerebellum is much greater than that of the cerebrum. In fact, it contains four times as many neurons, and yet it can't sustain consciousness, whereas the cerebrum can sustain consciousness. Even one half of the cerebrum can sustain consciousness. Even part of one half of the cerebrum can take consciousness. <laughs> so you're getting down to something very small, whereas something that is enormously rich and complex can't necessarily sustain consciousness. I mean, it might be said, well, you know, quite probably in the cerebrum, there are far more interconnections than there are in the cerebellum, but I'm sorry, that's not a neurological finding. That's uh, not, not the true neuroanatomy. In fact, the, some of the most complexly interconnected neurons, Purkinje cells are peculiar to the cerebellum. So uh, that would be part of my response to that. But I, you have to understand that I haven't really studied their theory in any great depth. Mm. No, no, I completely understand. I remember, as you mentioned, V.S. Ramachandran, uh, I, I love the way he calls the the right hemisphere the devil's advocate. Um, mm. <laughs> it's very, very interesting because it, it basically is. It is. It's the one that's going to let you question a little bit more. Uh, don't, yes. don't be so sure on your environment. Uh, have you, have you guys discussed this ever? Like wh when you guys talk about this and you talk about the way people are perceiving things. Well, I mean, what do you guys chat about? How do you guys come about uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> your discussion? I mean, I, can't, I can imagine the two of you having some very deep chats. Well, I'm hugely um, respectful towards and indebted to Ramachandran. And I think he's a, he's a great uh, mind in this area. And very fortunately, he um, is very receptive to my understanding of hemisphere differences and accepts that you know, the mainstream neuroscience that has neglected this for so long may be missing something. But I've, I've learned a lot from his writings and find them, first of all, extraordinarily well written and, and beautiful to read for somebody who may not have a technical background. But also the, the thinking is, is obviously very sophisticated. And what he points out, and which I completely agree with on the basis of everything I know, is that the right hemisphere is the one that deals with the more complex situation. So the left hemisphere has got a long way on its um, ticket as being uh, bright, because basically when the situation is fully specified, 
completely familiar and the procedures to produce an answer are those that it knows, the left hemisphere will get there quicker. And the reason it will get there quicker is that the right hemisphere takes that little bit extra time to go, yeah, but it may not be like that. It is the devil's advocate. When the left hemisphere is busy jumping to conclusions, the right hemisphere seems to be aware that jumping to conclusions is extremely serious. And interestingly, people who have right hemisphere damage and people with schizophrenia tend to jump to conclusions. And this business of jumping to conclusions is something that Michael Gazzaniga also pinpoints as the reason that the left hemisphere makes mistakes. It's too ready to bring out a little version of its own of, of what's happening, but the right hemisphere is more skeptical. And that's not what most people, like none of the things I would say about the differences between the left and right hemisphere, it's not what the the bad old um, caricatures suggested they suggested that somehow the right hemisphere was this oh laid back take it all easy kind of hemisphere that jumped to conclusions and didn't do its homework but it's really the other way around whenever we jump to a conclusion we're exercising the left hemisphere um, and not the right and it's the right hemisphere which actually also is more inhibitory of going down a path that may not be uh, productive of inhibiting the levels of emotion, uh, which is something that people don't think. They think the right hemisphere is the more emotional, but it is actually the more emotionally sophisticated, which is not the same thing as being over-emotional. The left hemisphere can have um, quite great uh, um, storms of anger and uh, irritability and uh, is also related to the sense of disgust. So things that disconnect us from and, and push the blame to something else, the left hemisphere is quite good at. That's part of its whole view, if you like, of um, the world, that uh, the problems don't lie with the left hemisphere, they lie somewhere else. Um, I don't want to divert too much from what we're talking about, but I'll just mention the quite extraordinary fact, in, in case people are not aware of this, that when people have a right hemisphere stroke and the whole left half of the body may be um, immobilized and paralyzed, uh, the person may completely deny that there is a problem. And if you point out that they can't do something with their hand, they say, oh, not my hand. Whose hand is it? Well, it belongs to the person in the next bed, or it belongs to my son, or it belongs to you, doctor, but never belongs to me because it's not working. And everything about me works very, very well. So there's a huge difference in this insanely and inanely optimistic self-view and view of the world by the left hemisphere and that of the right, which is much more realistic and perhaps a little more downbeat, but it gets close to reality. So um, where what I'm c coming to is this idea that um, the, the, the jumping to conclusions, the, the ability to um, simplify is the left hemisphere's way of doing things. It wants a fairly simple schema to work with. And it doesn't take into account the nuances, often which are implicit in the world seen by the right hemisphere. So I had an exchange with um, Dan Kahneman after uh, somebody wrote to uh, me and to him, I think, saying, uh, is your system one uh, basically the right hemisphere and your system two, the more deliberative system, the left hemisphere? And what we agreed was that it, it wasn't a left-right thing. It was to do with a different, um, if you like, pair of opponent processors, the uh, more superior or upper parts of the brain and the lower or more ancient parts of the brain. Uh, so that's right. But if anything, uh, since the uh, quick and dirty response is what the left hemisphere uh, tends to go for, the left hemisphere is more like Kahneman's system one and the right hemisphere, um, which is much more subtle in its thinking altogether and takes into account so many more options is more like his system two. Mind you, I don't buy the system one, system two thing anyway. I just think it's too, <laughs> it really is simplistic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think Kahneman does mention that he he's merely using this as a way of communicating to people, uh, simplifying it. Yes, that's absolutely so, right. So, to be fair. No, 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 no. I also don't think he really fundamentally breaks it down into a one and two. I Oh, of course, I know he he, he doesn't, um, and that 
you know, you can do the same thing with what I'm saying and you can ridicule it because it's very easy to oversimplify it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I utterly accept that. But what I meant was that now so often in um, not necessarily amongst uh, professional philosophers, but in lots of areas of, of thought, political, social and so on, people talk about system one and system two. And I have to go, no, I don't think that's going to be helpful. <laughs> I mean, it's very similar to people when they used to say, well, I'm more right-sided in terms of brains. I'm more left-sided thinking. 100%. Simply of course you're right. Completely wrong. I mean, we've yeah. that's been proven wrong so many years ago, and yet we still people still talk about that today. But I love that yes, you called your yes. first, I mean, one, one of your earlier books, uh, The Master and His Emissary, because the, the left hemisphere does think it has more power. Uh, it, 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 it is that lieutenant that wants to become the captain or the sar or well, whatever the, yes. the rank superior rank is and um, and yet they don't have the power to do it because the one in yeah. charge the one actually yeah. running it is the one that does a does a better job tell us why you defend yeah. the right hemisphere and why you think it's better in terms of society because clearly we're living in a left hemisphere driven world today yes why do I champion the right hemisphere view? Partly because it's it's absent from public discourse and it desperately needs to be present. It is actually more intelligent. Let me just put that on the table. I, I look at both emotional and social intelligence on the one hand and cognitive intelligence as measured by IQ on the other and suggest that the evidence is that the in each case, the right hemisphere actually contributes more to intelligence than the left. But it's also much more sensitive to and understands the complexity of what's going on in a way that the left hemisphere, because of its need to simplify and to make, um, to rule out what it would see as paradox, it, it, it oversimplifies reality. We know from physics that there are many paradoxes, and we know from the wisdom traditions that there are many paradoxes that I was aware of this, uh, don't mean to sound as though I was um, suddenly gifted at the age of 14 or 15, but I remember thinking, you know, about something as simple as politics, that when you push too far towards the left or the right, you reach the same place, really. And if you keep pushing in one direction, you arrive at the very point that you wanted to get away from. And Niels Bohr said that, you know, while the opposite of a trivial truth is, is, is not another truth, the opposite of a profound truth is very often another profound truth. Now, if we bore that in mind, we wouldn't make the simple minded dichotomies and um, plans for action that we do in which we push always something has served us well for a short while in a certain direction. But let's just keep pushing and pushing until it becomes insane. And we, for example, push for freedom and produce tyranny. You know, we push for um, hygiene and we create vulnerability to infection. We push for um, education, educating our young in some way and result in sort of uneducating them by teaching them not how to think, but how to absorb whatever information is currently in the zeitgeist. So all these things, uh, and I deal with loads of them right at the end of the book, suggest that we need to stop this purely selfish grabbing mentality of the left hemisphere. I mean, it is, it is unabashedly selfish. Um, when it comes to looking at morality, as I do, uh, the evidence is that when people have damage to the right hemisphere, they become much more um, selfish and act in a, in a way which is, yes, utilitarian, but there's a, that's a whole other conversation. Utilitarianism is a very, very odd way to be thinking about morality. And it's been commented that, uh, well, I don't want to go off on, on that because that will probably take us too far away from what I'm just saying. But no, no, you, what, what I'm really saying... Can, Ian, honestly, you can keep going. You can keep going. I'm fascinated. Okay, well, I will keep going on that one. But I must remember to come back to the current plight and why I think it's very important to um emphasize the the imbalance of the way in which we think um, on that point when people have um right hemisphere strokes or indeed frontal damage to either hemisphere um what happens is they tend to evaluate moral uh, dilemmas in a purely utilitarian way so utilitarian 
uh, assessment of a, a moral outcome is associated in uh, in neurology and psychiatry with with brain damage and inability to use part of the brain. And this has been beautifully demonstrated because, of course, you can temporarily knock out a part of the brain using transcranial magnetic stimulation and the person remains an intact individual after the procedure so that's very helpful and there's a well-known experiment that I'm sure you are familiar with where people are asked to assess moral behavior in a vignette which concerned two women who were having coffee together and the first one puts what she thinks is sugar in her friend's coffee but in fact it's poison and the friend dies and in the other scenario uh, the first person puts what she believes is poison into her friend's coffee and it turns out that it's only sugar and the friend lives which which of these scenarios reveals the actor the person who was manipulating the sugar as the more immoral well Almost everybody, when they're in a normal state of mind, losing all their brains, says, obviously, um, it's the second case in which she intended to kill. That's the immoral thing. But the good old left hemisphere, which judges things simply on a basis of outcome, and is not able to understand the importance of intention, which involves theory of mind and all this sort of thing, just go, well, obviously, um, it's the case in which somebody died. That was the dreadful outcome, and that's the immorality of the person who produced it. And I just wanted to comment, because uh, I like sort of um, being a little bit irritating at times, that it is slightly odd that in, um, in the Anglophone West, um, most moral philosophers uh, holding university posts uh, are um, in a way indebted to this utilitarian approach to moral dilemmas. And it's been pointed out that it's slightly odd that what is taken as the archetypally moral way to assess something is that which is used by people that we would normally consider um, deeply immoral. So there we are. I said that, but I want to come back to the sort of bigger point, which is when we look around and see the things that are, you know, threaten to destroy the world and destroy us, they are our treatment of, of the natural world and our treatment of our culture and civilization. Uh, and these seem to me to be the, the natural outcome of an unbalanced left hemisphere take on what the world is, that it is a heap of resource which is there for us to use and exploit in any way that we wish to do, and that we are not somehow part of that natural world, but are somehow outside it, manipulating it. But of course, we come out of nature and go back to nature. We are part of nature, which is why I tend to dislike the term environment, which suggests something that's around us and separate from us. I prefer the idea of nature, which means something that is always being born, which is, which is the reality um, of life. Uh, so, um, and not incidentally, uh, suggests a, a, a female goddess rather than um, the kind of <laughs> um, relentlessly uh, acquisitive uh, frame of mind of the, of the left hemisphere. So, I think we need to be very attentive to the way we think and stop uh, following this blindly. We need to question the assumptions we make philosophically about policies, uh, to th think differently about education, to think differently about industry and our impact on uh, nature. We need to think differently about society. And above all, we need to respect three things that I have discovered in researching the psychiatric literature are most important to the flourishing of a human being. What are those three things? Well, I refer to one at the end of the Master and His Emissary, and it's the concept of social cohesion, the fact of belonging to a cohesive social group. Um, and this is something that with increased mobility, with people being deracinated from one culture and thrust down in another, has become more problematic than it was and through industrialization demanding people leave the communities where their forebears lived for a thousand years and go somewhere else altogether.
together. So uh, it's not automatic that we can maintain this sense of an integral culture. But where we have looked at cohesive societies that do retain some degree of what one might think of as traditional togetherness, sharing the same sorts of points of view, the same moral values, perhaps the same rituals, perhaps the same religious beliefs, that this produces a kind of cohesion which results in happiness, less mental illness and less physical illness. So those are pretty much all the things that if we ask us, well, what would we think are the characteristics of human flourishing, they would surely be that we avoid ill health, either psychiatric or physical, and that we have some sense of um, being happy. What, what, that, what that means, of course, is another matter. And we often take that to mean increasing um, access to pleasure. But uh, as of course, you know, there is something called the hedonist paradox that means that when you pursue pleasure, you don't actually find it. And it comes as a byproduct of forgetting yourself and being um, involved with other people. So that's one is social cohesion. But I just want to briefly to mention the other two. The first is distance from nature. So once again, until perhaps 150, 200 years ago, almost everybody in the world lived embedded in the natural world. All around them, they would have seen things growing and dying and the seasons, they would see the wonderful complexity and beauty of the natural world all around them. And they wouldn't have thought of themselves as somehow alien to it or separate from it. They would see where they sat in that context. And we now know, and there's a huge literature on this, that alienation from the natural world um, causes unhappiness, causes um, uh, insecurity, aggression, uh, cognitive uh, impairment, uh, mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, stress disorders, and actually also like social cohesion has an effect on physical health. So that being deprived of nature uh, is one of the things that actually causes one to have a higher risk of things like heart attack, stroke and so forth. And that actually spending time in the natural world has beneficial effects on your cognition, on your mood, and on your physical health, equivalent to stopping smoking and going to the gym several times a week. And this is also true of the last of these, which is a connection to a spiritual realm, having a vision of, of the world which goes beyond the uh, merely materialistic. And I say merely materialistic in two senses. Uh, there's also the first of all the obvious sense is just materialistic but also a view of material as just material there is nothing just about the material world if you like to put it that way there is nothing simple about matter matter is as complex as consciousness and in my belief is bound up with it as i, I may have mentioned but in any case, there is a vast body of research that I only discovered in the last year or two, because I haven't really reflected on it very much, which shows that once again, um, characteristics of personality, uh, of, of mental well-being, um, of physical well-being are promulgated and enhanced in, uh, in communities where one has um, a sense of the spiritual beyond the, the purely immediate world and uh, that alienation from that causes um, harm in various ways. So those three things we've cut ourselves off from, and they're not exactly what the left hemisphere would have seen as important because they're all to do with networks of things that are not just my needs, at least in the initial phase, uh, and that involve understanding that there are lots of implicit sources of meaning and fulfillment in the world and are not the obvious ones. The left hemisphere is dealing with the obvious, the crude, the simple, the basic. It doesn't know what it is that it doesn't know. And like people who don't know what it is they don't know, it thinks it knows everything. Mm. There's a phenomenon in psychology, I'm sure you know, called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which basically means that people who don't know much think they know everything, but people who know a lot feel that they don't know anything because they know the extent of what they don't know. And that takes us back to this idea of the master and the emissary, because in that image of the master and the emissary, the emissary doing the work of the master, but not actually being the master, in that metaphor, I'm suggesting the right hemisphere is the master and the left hemisphere 
is the one that does the work for the master and is the emissary. And that's the opposite of the way that in our left hemisphere world, traditionally, this has been thought. It's been thought the left hemisphere is the one that does as all the heavy lifting. In fact, I've got Michael Gazzaniger on, on film saying exactly that. And also saying, by the way, um, the mind and the brain are just a machine. Get used to it. Um, I, I respect enormously his work. He's contributed so much to our knowledge of neurology and he's uh, an honorable and honored man. But I don't accept this particular philosophical um, turn, this reductionist turn. So, um, uh, anyway, there we are. I mean, I think these things are important because they are the they are what we need to survive if the world is going to survive at all, and for us to fulfil um, what it is to be a human being. I start this new book, um, The Matter with Things, by asking an ancient question, which was the question of Plotinus in the third century AD. But we, he says, who are we? And it has that lovely resonance so you can feel a man who's really thinking about the speaking he doesn't just say who are we he says but we who are we like what is that and i think that is such a profound question and if we had a proper sophisticated life fulfilled answer to that question we wouldn't be destroying the world we wouldn't be destroying our society and we wouldn't be destroying ourselves do you know uh, ian when i read um a lot of the work done by, I mean, yourself, by people like Says, a lot of phenomenologists, um, even if you think about people like Heidegger, um, a lot of the type of language we use, I mean, especially if we're talking English right now, it's very difficult to convey the type of ideas you're trying to express. Uh, so I, yes. I, I, I almost pity you in that sense. It's almost as if had we had a, be a better method of communication, uh, perhaps Sanskrit or, or maybe even German, since it's a, such a good one, that can give you more information per sentence, per punctuation, whatever, uh, that you'd be able to express this a lot better. Do you feel that that's the case? Do you feel that when you express your views to people, they just don't understand it because it is just too difficult linguistically to express. I'm sure that's right. And in fact, when I was about 26 and had uh, finished the manuscript of my first book against criticism, um, I was talking to a colleague uh, at All Souls in Oxford who was a great Sinologist, expert in Chinese literature. And he was a, a lovely and very wise man. And when I was explaining the difficulty I had in trying to make certain points in English in that book, you know, why is the implicit so important? Why can't it be made explicit and just still be the same? And he said, you know, for all these pro problems you're, you're facing, the Chinese have words that express these different things that you're trying to get at. And, you know, for a while I thought, okay, Either I follow my initial inclination, which is to leave the secure position as an academic and go off and be a medical student, or I go and learn Chinese. And anyway, history tells that I did the, the medical thing, not the Chinese thing. But uh, and of course, I don't know any Chinese at all, but I do know enough uh, written by people who do know Chinese to be able to use sometimes the language. Uh, the concepts in Chinese which we don't have. And I, I think you're exactly right to say Sanskrit too. Uh, in fact, in many languages other than uh, Western languages, and in some ways English is a very flexible language. It's often said that it has many words for something that other languages sometimes only have one word for, but it can work both ways. And my experience is perhaps because I'm more aware of it, because my native language is English, that I'm often struggling to be able to translate a word I understand perfectly well that's used in German, but we really don't have an equivalent to it. Mm. And in fact, when I first started going to Germany in my late teens, which was a, another amazing experience for me, it was almost like being reborn. I don't know what it was, but I just thought, my God, this is a whole other way of thinking about the world. It's so rich. But what I... Um, what I felt was that, you know, it's often the case that German has more words and that we have simplified things. Mm. But there are examples the other way. I mean, one terrible thing in English is that we only have one word for to know. 
but just about every other language has at least two words you know for to know a fact like that Paris is the capital of France and to know Paris like I lived there for several years so I know it um, and we don't but equally you know in German the word Geist means both spirit and intellect which causes some sort of uh, problems of translation sometimes but no you're, you're dead right that the language is against it and so you need to try and get across the findings of phenomenological philosophers and that's not terrifically easy because mostly they didn't write very well um, Heidegger is not really somebody you go to for lessons in how to be lucid <laughs> and in fact I think he says somewhere that he's deliberately obscure and some people would say yeah I've always thought he was phony, but that's not quite what he meant. What he meant was that unless people are made to go the journey themselves, they don't understand what it is he's saying. So you have to actually work to understand it. And to me, this is like if you've been driven a route any number of times, but you weren't the driver, you can't really remember it that well. But if you've driven it even once, you really remember it. And I think it's something more like that. But what I found easier is Shayla. Max Scheler, um, who was um, a contemporary of Heidegger's, um, somewhat younger and, and died earlier. Um, but he and, um, and Henri Bergson, who's, not, who's been shamefully neglected and is, all the things that are said about him are, are, are mainly wrong, rather than like the things that people say about the hemisphere differences hypothesis. When, um, sorry, I'm... I just lost track of what I wanted to ask you there initially. Um, there was something specific. But anyway, when you're talking about your travels, there's something that I thought about. Um, I think I did read at some point that you you, you worked at Stellenbosch. I, was that Stellenbosch, South Africa? Were you, were you down here? Yes, it was. Oh. Yes, they offered me um, a, a fellowship at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Stellenbosch. Yeah, and it was a glorious... How was your time? Uh, a couple of months. Ago. Which is actually where I got yeah. my degree from, my med medical degree. So, so uh, at least the alma mater. How wonderful. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. How wonderful. How was your time here? What are, you, what are your yeah. thoughts on the cultural differences here? Because, I mean, this place is very culturally dynamic. When you think about it, a mixture of, of, of African culture, Indian culture coming in. I mean, we often, we came in as the slaves. My ancestors came in as slaves. So there's Eastern traditions mixed with Western traditions and African traditions. Yes. Um, in terms of yes. hemispheric yes. differences, how was your experiences? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I wasn't there perhaps long enough to make any profound philosophical observations. Um, although on first principles, I think that a, a melting pot of that kind that brings together so many different strands um, is, is very interesting and, and rich. Um, I felt slightly sad that the, the the relative freedom of people in South Africa since the overthrow of apartheid and all that had not resulted in the sort of um, uh, empowerment or uh, that's a, a word I don't very much like, but the 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 sort of um, emancipation of uh, of particularly black people in South Africa, yeah. and that much really in some ways hadn't changed that should have changed sorry yeah, no, yeah exactly i agree it's almost as if it hasn't been solved yet i mean they are clear they're, they're distinct no. roads where on the one side you've got mansions moving across and then on the other side you've got these tin houses we call them shacks yes just well on the other yes. side just across one road that's how deep the segregation yes. still lies today so it's, it's pretty yes. no, no i know so it's a shame that actually very little in that respect has has altered much um, also, I'm and the levels of crime are worry. Um, I have to say that uh, I know people who've really uh, suffered horrendous crimes in South Africa, and I, in, in all my life, nobody's ever broken into a house where I've been sleeping. But in <laughs> two months that I was in Stellenbosch, and Stellenbosch in a in a rather smart area of Stellenbosch, uh, and Stellenbosch is one of the most prosperous places in South Africa. Exactly. We were broken into in the night. I mean, I didn't come to any harm, but and this is a place that had razor wire and it also had laser beams. I mean, there was nothing peculiar about this house. That's what they're all like. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had 
wow, this is this is spooky. And I probably did things I shouldn't have done. I walked around at night, you know, on my own. <laughs> and people said, you did that? And <laughs> But I tell you what, I just came away with a very, very nice, very, very warm feeling. And it was partly also that it is a sensationally beautiful, natural, scene there i've never been anywhere in the world where it is more beautiful than the cape yeah um and we went up to oh i can't is it karoo is it called Kourou? yeah the clan karoo the, the yes Kourou, yeah. um and that of course is different again and stayed in one of the kloofs you know these great ravines mm. and in fact there was a forest fire there at the time which was spooky because it was not that far across the ravine and if the wind had changed direction it could have engulfed us overnight it's but it was absolutely extraordinary to be in this deep cliff and see the, the, the light and the fire. I, I, I will never, never forget it. But just the sheer beauty of landscape, the, the coast, the mountains, the, the flora and the fauna and the birds, you know, so, so beautiful. I mean, that's, it's the type of environment that you can picture our ancestors being truly embedded. You know, that is the nature you're yeah. talking about. That would have been the time where yeah, really. every possible theory, uh, whether Eastern, whether Western, it wouldn't have mattered. It would have somehow incorporated yeah. this dynamic system, yeah. this ever-changing relational yeah. system. Uh, I think at some point you say it's yeah. relationship over relata, uh, prior to relata. Yeah. Um, uh, it, yeah. How do you think we can go about getting this right hemisphere, championing, championing it, and and trying to get it to uh, to become the the priority how, how can we do this <laughs> it's a tough one well it's it's a very good question and i'm sure you don't expect me to have half a dozen bullet points but and, and i'm going to disappoint you if you did because i don't have them but i think that what i'm talking about is something that's not a, solved by a few fixes but it's solved by a revolution in the way we think about what we are and what the world is and how we relate. And that is the reason that I devoted, you know, the last few decades of my life, really, to, and I'm 68, so I'm never going to write another big book. I mean, this last one nearly killed me. And, I, you know, it's 1,500 pages before you get to the bibliography, which is a couple of hundred pages in itself. Um, so I can't, I can't really say it's this but what i can say is that people respond to my work in a very heartening way so i get an incredibly rich span of people writing to me young people um, older people um, very sophisticated people um, judges bishops um, you know professors but i also get people like um, a long distance lorry driver um, a cleaner um <laughs> admittedly rather unusual perhaps but for for the job they're doing but still responding and when i go and talk a lot of young people come up to me afterwards and say this is absolutely amazing and what are we going to do about it and the fact that they're thinking about what are we going to do about it is as much the answer as any answers they could come up with now mm -hmm. i'm a psychiatrist by training and I realized a long time ago that it's no good telling people what they should do because they won't believe you. I mean, they could have thought of that and then they wouldn't be coming to see you. So what you need to work is a complete change in them in the way in which they think about things. And so you say, well, look, this is how you've been thinking and it hasn't worked. It's led to suffering and none of the things you care about has been achieved. How about thinking a bit differently? and then discussing with them possible alternatives. So what I'm really doing is putting out to people, I hope a, a complete and coherent picture of another way of being in the world. Mm. And that if one sees that and responds to it, one will know almost intuitively what has to be done and what must be changed. I mean, I can talk about um, various ways in which we we stifle originality we over bureaucratize we um we've become uninventive and uncreative in the way we think because of far too many rules about things you can say and things you can do and so on. and we need to generate a different kind of cohesive way of living i mean a lot of industrialization has simply resulted in social fragmentation so these things need, in some sense, to be 
rather urgently put into reverse. But I do know a lot of movements, which uh, green movements, social movements, and so on, that are moving in the right direction. And so I have hope. I think I, I'm I not mean, optimistic, book... but I have hope. Sorry. <laughs> your book sort of gives people like, I mean, if someone comes to me and says, Tevin, how do we solve some of the polit political issues we have today? I mean, your book is one of those, it, it can be one of those books you give to someone merely to educate themselves yes. on some of the decisions we make. So I think you're already doing that merely by writing these books. So you've already provided the next generation with with, with layers of information that they're, they're probably going to start using and implementing. If judges are talking to you, if bishops are talking to you, they obviously want some sort of a practical way to use this type of information. Yes. But, you know, what I want to ask you is, what do some of your uh, let's say not haters, but people who object to your theory. Uh, what, what do they tell you to counter? Because I made this podcast as a way for anyone who has a thesis, anyone who has some some sort of a philosophical theory of mind or anything regarding spirituality, free will, consciousness. Mm. Um, we'll touch on mm. free will perhaps just now, but as a platform for them to express their views and and make mm. it clear to the audience. Because nowadays people. I mean, they see a thick book like yours. I mean, the matter of things, it's 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 quite a read. Uh, they want to hear it from the author themselves. Um, what are the object objections you get? What do people often tell you that I think that you want to defend right now? Well, there are two aspects to this. One concerns science and the other concerns philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, I haven't had trouble at all with physicists. They tend to find what I have to say very interesting. And of course, there are many different strands in physics, but um, a lot of people who I know in physics have endorsed and, and found richness in, in this take. In terms of the, the biological science, there are really only two groups of people, those who've read my work and who haven't objected to it, and those who haven't read my work and have said, oh, well, that's about hemisphere difference. We, we left all that behind 30 years ago. So, you know, I've got to just accept that there will be a stick in the mud who don't know what they're talking about, who will nonetheless say this strange thing that that's all been exploded. No, what has been exploded was the wrong story. But that doesn't mean to say there isn't a better story. There's something there that we have all got to contend with, that our brain has two halves that see the world differently. I'm sorry, that's a fact. They're structured differently and nature has kept them separate. Why? We've got to address these questions. And nobody has begun to say that the evidence I put forward is not right. I mean, nobody has. And in, to be fair, it would take them years They'd have to go through all the research that has taken me so long and show that somehow I've misunderstood it or misrepresented it. And I, I don't think I've done either of those. Mm -hmm. So that's the, on the science side. On the philosophy side, well, um, there are always differences. You know, that, that there are people who, um, are, are, um, in my view, naive materialists and reductionists, and, and they, of course, won't like what I have to say because it's not naively materialist or reductionist. But that's what you expect in philosophy. I mean, there's never going to be agreement. People belong to different points of view. I don't really belong in any one camp exactly, if you see what I mean. As I said earlier, I'm not really quite like any of the other. My position is slightly different. But for those who are interested in, in, the, in the philosophical position on um, I, I tackled that very early on in like the first 10 or 12 pages of the book, as well as some of the aspects of the way I think about the world that will seem at the outset paradoxical or impossible, but will, I hope, by the time people follow me through the stages of the book, seem to make sense, and that perhaps instead of dismissing them, they might think that only somebody who didn't understand would actually dismiss them. So that's that's the, the way it works. You know, I begin with neuropsychology in this new book, The Matter with Things, because if I'm trying to find out what can we take to be not the absolute truth, we'll never know that, of course, and it's not single, but to know things that are truer than other things. We all need to know things that are truer, otherwise we wouldn't know any basis for action or thought. 
And if the two hemispheres are presenting different worlds, then we need to evaluate those worlds. And I do that. And it's very clear that if we have a choice and we have a marker which shows that this is the characteristic imprint of the left hemisphere trying to solve this problem, and this is the characteristic imprint of the right hemisphere trying to solve this problem, we know which one we should favor. And then the second part of the book, I look at what you might call epistemology. In other words, how do we understand and come to know anything? And I guess that I, I you know, I say most people would probably think that one of the ways is through following the science. One of the ways is through using reason and another is using intuition or imagination. And I look at all four of those and I suggest that no one of those or even two of them on their own are enough. That we need at least three and if possible, four of them. And that in each case, despite what people are taught at school, it's not the sort of plodding serial thinking of the left hemisphere that makes the breakthroughs. It's actually the insights that come to the left hemisphere. When you get a, a sudden insight into a situation and it resolves, there's a change in the gestalt, in the overall shape of what it is you're looking at. And you get what's called an aha moment. And that moment is associated very robustly with activity in the right superior temporal gyrus, right superior temporal sulcus and the amygdala, the right amygdala. So it's those things that actually help us see. And then the last third of the book, the third and final part, is what one might have to call metaphysics. It's so what, since we've gone through this, what does what do we now think might be true? And I look at the structure of the cosmos. Uh, I begin by looking at the coincidence of opposites, which we neglect. I look at the relationship between multiplicity and unity, which is neither neither extreme of these is good, but actually everything survives and thrives when these two are held together. And then I look at the building blocks like time, space, matter, consciousness, and more controversially, things like values and purpose and the sense of the sacred, um, which I believe are, again, irreducible. They're not sort of uh, emergent from the other aspects that I've mentioned. They are uh, ontological primitives. And you're not being unscientific if you entertain them, think about them in a reasonable way. And that's what I aim to do. And I hope to shift people's thinking. And, and, and at the moment, the commonest thing that people say is it, it just changes your whole view of the world. So that's lovely. I mean, if that happens, I can die happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely I think it's definitely going to happen quite often uh, what comes to mind when I think of it is a pluralism this is a very pluralistic approach to to the environment uh, taking it all in making making this very relational um, that's what comes to mind but but where I was headed was what you just uh, discussed and this is a two-parter though um, Ian what were your spiritual slash religious views prior to you coming through this journey and figuring out all the things you've you've realized over the years and what are they now is the first part and the second part is mm. is how do we look at this this world in the divine sense and and um how do we create meaning purpose what i mean what is the purpose of all of this well those are huge huge questions uh, to bring up at the last minute but um i mean the first thing i would say is that I don't think that meaning and purpose are created simply by our minds. I don't think that they are inventions. I think they are discoveries. In other words, that they are intrinsic and we can fail to see them by adopting a very simplistic way of thinking. But every people in the world until now in the West have thought that these elements were very important aspects of the fabric of the universe, which I believe, in fact, they are. Saying exactly what they are, particularly in the, in the case of the sacred, is a very difficult thing to bring off. And the last substantive chapter before the epilogue, the one that's called The Sense of the Sacred, and which is over 100 pages, so it is a short book on its own. Nothing I've ever written in my life cost me more grief, uh, more trouble, more time than this. Because on the one hand, I knew that it was a foolish thing to try and talk about it at all. Because all those who've equipped themselves to know about it have said, have given the same warning, this cannot be reduced to words, the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. And 
St. Augustine said, uh, si comprehendis non est Deus, if you understand it, it's not God you've understood, which makes a rather a nice pair with Richard Feynman's, if you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. So our language was built for everyday purposes. It was built for practical purposes. So when we get into the more rarefied areas, we don't have words, or at least we, we do sometimes have words, but the words may be more of an obstacle than a help because they may encourage us to think that just by having a word we now understand it but i need to problematize the ready understanding of what god is and i don't i can't say what god is i mean i'd be a complete fool if i even tried to i think that there is something in the which is central to the the business of the universe which one can find no other term for than the sacred or the divine. And I know, as you know, I take great pains to examine things and see it from different points of view and discuss different positions on it. Um, so I, my, my thoughts about it didn't change during the writing. They started evolving in my teens um, and to give some context there very briefly, I came from a home in which nobody talked in religious terms, whatever. My parents never went to church and weren't interested in that. I think my father um, thought it was all rather silly and, you know, a bit childish or something like that. Um, but then I began, uh, I went to a school which it's not a religious school, but it has a very long tradition and was founded actually to produce in the 14th century to produce uh, priests, monks and bishops. And uh, some of that lingers on in the architecture and the way of thinking, which is to be open to these things, not to see them as obviously wrong or to be dismissed. And um, I met a lot of very impressive people who clearly did believe in something that they called religious or divine or sacred. And I thought it was extremely important. I thought they were the wiser people I met. I thought they were people who knew how to respond to the beauty of sacred music, to the beauty of sacred architecture, sacred poetry, and so on. I didn't think that they conformed to this archetype of, of fools. <laughs> no, they seemed to me quite the opposite. And at one point, I actually thought that I would probably um, uh, leave university and go into a monastic order. I thought that probably this was the most important thing I could do with my life. Um, fortunately, some common sense entered and I realized I was a very bad um, individual to take on for any monastery. I wouldn't really conform properly at all. And I liked too many worldly things far too much. So I decided not to do that, but carried on a philosophical and theological quest, which is very, you know, has resulted in something that I can't say what it is, but I consider that to be a very benign outcome. I think that it's when people can say too glibly and too fluently what it is they feel about this and what they believe to be the case about it, that we're more likely to run into trouble, not always, but quite often. Mm -hmm. So I'm very impressed by the what's called the apophatic tradition in spirituality, which is the belief that you can't say what is the case, but you can say what is not the case. And actually, that is exactly the way that science progresses. Science can never say this is the case. Science can only say that according to the, um, the, the model or the paradigm that we currently espouse, we can say that this is not the case. This is also not the case. What does that leave us with? We're narrowing things down. And I see it as like the way a sculptor creates a statue, not by putting together a leg, a torso, an arm and a head or whatever it might be, but actually by just clearing away what is not needed. And it's that clearing away that is meant by the very different kind of enlightenment, not the 18th century European enlightenment, which, which was a very positive step in many directions. This great problem was hubris. It thought that it knew everything and it certainly didn't. But what I mean is spiritual enlightenment. Spiritual enlightenment in all the traditions I know is this business of clearing away of um, a not knowing, in fact, this fertile 
uh, ground of not knowing, which also exists interestingly in the, in the West. So you, uh, if you've read that chapter, you know I quote a lot of medieval Christian mystics whose thinking is very much in keeping with that of um, Oriental sages and so on. And perhaps I could just mention that this idea of the master and his emissary of a wise uh, force that sort of knows and can lead us towards something good and positive and another resentful less knowing force which thinks unfortunately that it knows it all and wants to usurp the place of the master this image which is that of um, the sources apprentice um, is is present in many different traditions that I've looked at. It's right there in the secret of the golden flower, important um, 8th and ninth century uh, Chinese text. It's there in uh, a legend, which I uh, report in the book, of the Onondaga people who are Iroquois um, Native American people. And I, I think that the story they tell of how the world came into being is so profound and it's there and, and indeed of this rivalry uh, and it's there also in the Kabbalah, the, the, the body of uh, mystical thought in Judaism and I believe it's there, uh, although I, you would probably know this perhaps better than I do, in, um, in the Sanskrit literature, uh, I, I haven't actually come across that particular image. Sorry? I said, I said yes, it definitely is. Yes, yes. So what's pleasing to me is that taking neurology and taking philosophy and taking physics as three rather far dispersed lands on the surface of the globe, by going in to the core of this globe, I find that we come to the same place and that we actually find that that same place is also the place that those sages in the past who have equipped themselves to have wisdom have also found themselves. And I wish we could capture that again. I think we need science to be a great deal more humble, more open to awe, and to be more understanding of different points of view, not so rigid. The enemy of science is dogma, and there's too much dogma in science. Good science is never dogmatic. Yes. Good anything is never dogmatic. So religion is terrible when it becomes dogmatic. So it's very important that we avoid dogma. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, I mean, those three fields coming together, it, it just, it works well with your theory as well. I mean, that relation, relational dynamic between the three of them, that, that symbiosis, it, it's a beautiful one. Just, just to conclude, um, Ian, I mean, I often ask the, the, this question because the listeners seem to want to know this. Um, if you had to recommend maybe like five books or five authors at least, or at most, or whatever, however many you want, that they love to know how you get to the point where you get, um, what books influence you the most, what should they read to understand you better? And I think it works well with this relational dynamic because it helps them get a little bit more inside your head. Yes, yes. Very good. Um... Well, I've mentioned two big influences for me were John Cutting. Actually, his work, The um, Principles of Psychopathology, was the most influential for me, and uh, Louis Sass's Madness and Modernism. But I would probably go further back in, in history to the work of William James. Just about everything he wrote is completely fascinating. And he, he set so much out that we have discovered to be true at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. He's a, a thoroughly remarkable person. Because of the course my life took, I read Henry James much earlier than William James, but I'm now absolutely no doubt that um, William James was far the more interesting, insightful and intelligent and imaginative of the two. Um, though it doesn't have to be a battle. Um, all due respect to Henry James. Um, another actually is, I mentioned Henri Bergson, and there's a book called The Creative Mind, I think, which is extraordinarily important. It's a collection of lectures and essays. And he has the advantage that he says quite sophisticated things in more readily accessible language than people like Heidegger and Scheler and so on, from whom I've also learnt a lot. Um, so those are the sort of people that come to mind, philosophically speaking. Um, 
although uh, there are many others, of course. There's, uh, there are books of spiritual kind that one could would speak of, and there are philosophers of the past like Spinoza and Leibniz and and so on, who I think are very interesting. I don't always agree with what they have to say, but they're enormously provocative writers. And very, very important is Heraclitus. To me, the pre-Socratic philosophers are the most astute in the history of Western philosophy, and they're right at the outset of it. <laughs> and interestingly, they they are able to contact a vision of reality which is quite simple to the one put similar. Sorry, not simple. Quite similar to the one put forward by great Eastern sages. And we know that at that period, about the sixth century BC, there was quite a lot of exchange of ideas with exchange of merchandise between the Eastern Mediterranean and the, the Orient. So that may be one of the reasons why. But I like to think that also if you begin to think about the world without too many of the preconceptions that have bedeviled Western thinking for nearly 2000 years, you're quite likely to come to these conclusions uh, separately. So um, Heraclitus is fragments, um, easy to find, very, spend a lifetime understanding them. There's a brilliant book by uh, R.C. Khan, uh, I think it's Richard Khan, I'm not sure. Um, the Art and Thought of Heraclitus is another very important book for me. Um, and this goes nowhere near what is really very, very dear to my heart, which is books of poetry and, and a few novels. So, but I can't, I can't encompass everything, but those are the things that are most immediately relevant to that I've mentioned that are probably most it's, immediately relevant to my my recent thinking. It's funny because while well, 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 you're giving me this list, something that's coming to my mind is when I remember, I think you once mentioned uh, in another interview that one of the quotes by Plato where he talks about the fact that you can't write philosophy. You have to, you can't read it, sorry. Yes. Uh, this has to be conversational. Yeah. You've got to be directly engaged into it. So even if they do read it, uh, still doesn't change the yes. fact that they were not there, <laughs> not experiencing it. That's, That's lovely. And it puts the one side of Plato that I like into perspective that he was in a way as as more modern philosophers have become more process philosophers, that it's a process in which minds connect with one another. And in his seventh epistle, Plato describes this way in which you understand another mind is by living together and then a spark leaps from one soul to the other, he says, and it starts a fire. And that actually is my experience of reading the people who have been influential to me and above all the people who taught me who were influential is that they were in one sense on fire, that they talked about what made them tick, what made them excited, what made them feel that they were close to something in that about which they were profoundly interested and enthusiastic. And that is the way teaching should be not this business of, you know, there are six things you must know about this. And if you can recite them, we give you full remarks. That's no way to educate anybody. <laughs> exactly. I mean, just having this conversation with you has changed, obviously changed me so much. I mean, these interactions fundamentally change our neurochemistry, um, we, we become different people once we leave this conversation. So we're both fundamentally affected by each other right now. And the listeners, Absolutely. Are, I mean, you came in very high, by the way, this is just an extra note, uh, just before we conclude, when, when I put out a post of someone I should interview, you came in very highly recommended. People were uh, very intrigued because this, because yeah. it's, I think it's mainly because of what we discussed, this difficulty for you yeah. to express it due to the language, but yeah. I think you've done an excellent job. Is there anything else you'd like to say to conclude before we end, Ian? Apart from a very big thank you, <laughs> um, that I'm, I'm very pleased to think that gradually, whatever it is I've got to say of importance, I think there are things that probably are, that people are beginning to respond to them in the way that they are. This is how life progresses and this is how life is passed on from one to another and it's it's wonderful to feel that in some small way i'm part of that you know I, you. Started, I started this podcast um mind body solution trying to get one step closer to the mind body solution and i think because of you we've obviously taken that step i don't ever think we'll solve it i think it's too difficult of a problem maybe 
we will. Yeah. I don't know, but I think your work definitely does help us uh, get there. And I really appreciate the time take you've taken to oh, chat yeah. to me. No, well, thank you very much, Tevin. Um, I'm very grateful, and I hope that your listeners enjoy it. Oh, they definitely will. Thanks, Ian. I really appreciate it. <laughs>